Plato's The Sophist is not his most well-known dialogue. And yet, I think it may well be his most important. And that's the argument I'm going to make today. Plato lived from 427 to 347 BCE before the birth of Christ or thereabouts. We don't know the exact dates that he lived because there's no secure record of that. He's known primarily for his theory of ideal forms, and this gets articulated in his most famous dialogue, The Republic, and also subsequently in the Phaedo. And these dialogues really form the essence of his philosophy. And the sophist is thought of not as central because it doesn't really discuss the theory of forms or the essential parts of his philosophy. It's considered one of the late dialogues, although any dating of the dialogues is always uncertain because the dating is, can only be done through formal or content analysis. So, so the form of certain dialogues looks similar, so scholars date them in the same period. But again, we don't know for sure when the dialogues are dated, so we can't say there's a development in Plato's thought from one point to another. We just don't know. That said, many subsequent thinkers have pointed, pointed to the importance of the sophist uh, in the way that I'm going to do today, and they have focused on the thing that I'm going to focus on. One of these thinkers is Frederick Wilhelm Joseph Schelling, who was a member of the group of thinkers known as the German idealists, and his interest in Plato's sophist focuses on the role that negation has in constituting human freedom. Schelling's book, Philosophical Investigations into the Essence of Human Freedom, is one of the major texts in the philosophy of freedom, and Schelling has an important place for Plato's sophist in this work. Schelling contends that the sophist actually represents a key point, maybe the first point, in the discovery of freedom and the path towards understanding what exactly freedom is. Schelling believes that in order for us to be free, we have to have the ability to negate. We have to have the ability to say no to what is, to say that there's something that is not that we can talk about. And this is where he sees freedom being asserted in the sophist. In other words, what isn't must in some sense be, even though that doesn't really make sense. How can it how can something that isn't be? Well, Schelling thinks if we don't claim this in some way, we can never be free. The other thinker that takes an interest in Plato's The Sophist and, and makes an important part of his thinking is Martin Heidegger. Now, Heidegger did a seminar on Plato's Sophist, and in that seminar, he says, Plato understands the not and negation as disclosive. The denying, the saying no, is a letting be seen and is not, as in the case of mere exclusion corresponding to the pure calling by name, a letting disappear, a bringing of what is said to nothing. For Heidegger, what's great about Plato's sophist is that it understands how the rejection, the negation of something can actually make something or make nothing appear to us as significant. So to put it in Heidegger's terms, it discloses the world to us in a certain way. So negation for Heidegger is not just an absence of something or it's making an absence, it's making a nothing into something important for us. And that's what Plato does in the sophist that hadn't been done before him. You might say that negation is not nothing, but actually brings things into our consideration. It's, and that's why Heidegger uses the word disclosive. It's disclosive for us. It discloses nothing to us. Or negation, negation is a mode of disclosing the world. This is Heidegger's, this is what he's getting at in his seminar on the sophist. So both Schelling and Heidegger are interested in the sophist because it really marks the first time in the history of Western philosophy that negation has a primary role to play. So it's the first assertion of 
negation or the negative or nothing as philosophically important or theoretically important. And for Schelling, negation is the basis of freedom. And I would add it's the basis of all interpretive efforts. So if we don't in some way negate what's there in front of us, we can never engage in the act of interpretation. The goal of the sophist really isn't to introduce negation at all, even though this is the main event that happens in this dialogue. Instead, the goal is to critique sophistry. So let's understand what sophistry is, and then I think what Plato's getting at will become clearer. So the dialogue proceeds with an, a visitor from Alea who understands objects through the practice of division. And as you're first reading the dialogue, this becomes a very annoying, I think, for the modern reader way of going about things. Just to, to take the most absurd example that, so he's practicing this method of division just to understand what he picked someone supposedly at random, an angler, someone who fishes. And he comes down to this idea that we divide between one who uses a net and one who hooks the fish. So this is just an absurd way to divide. You could divide, and you can see, I think, that you can divide in any number of ways, not like you can't, like the sophist will div divide between someone who hunts on land and someone who fishes. Well, why is that division more appropriate than someone who hunts for birds and someone who hunts for animals that that walk on the land? So as you can see, there's no, the, the problem with this mode of, of understanding through division is that nothing really separates the division from being arbitrary. So there's something a little bit off. I think we can see in the visitor's method from the beginning. So that, to my mind, that's not what's significant about this dialogue at all. And I think most thinkers, Schelling and Heidegger as well, agree with this. Through this method, though, I think the visitor does come to a pretty good understanding of what the sophist is. The sophist is someone who has the appearance of being wise without being wise. So sophistry means I'm going to how I appear is more important than I am. So the fact that the sophist isn't wise is crucial to sophistry, that, that getting at truth is not something essential that the sophist is concerned with, but rather what kind of appearance does sophistry produce? That's what the sophist cares about. For Plato, the sophist actually imitates the philosopher, or imitates one who knows. So, so sophistry is an imitation of actual knowing and this is where you can see the importance of negation. We have to, to understand imitation. We have to understand that there is nothing or there's negation of what one would be. So one to appear as something which is not what one is, one through imitation, one has to be not something else. So there's that act of negation in essential to sophistry. This is how Plato puts it. A false belief is believing those which are not. So one comes to a false belief by believing in something that isn't. So in other words, I believe that unicorns actually exist. This is a false belief because unicorn, unicorns don't actually exist. So this would be the most basic example of what Plato's getting at. In other words, Sophists take what is not as what is true. So primarily sophistry is dissimulation. It's making what isn't true appear as what is true. But sophists don't put it that way. Their claim is that truth itself is a problematic category. So sophistry is based upon, in some certain sense, the, re the, the rejection of the idea of truth. And I think this, I wouldn't necessarily call Friedrich Nietzsche a sophist, but this very, very famous line from his late notebooks, I think, is a sophistic idea. He says, facts are just what there are. Facts are just what there aren't, sorry. There are only interpretations. I wanted to, I, my slip wanted to get it to, to change what Nietzsche was saying. Uh, so the point is for Nietzsche that all we have is our way of interpreting the world, 
there's no truth outside of our interpretation. I think in some way that's correct, but I think this idea has a sophistical quality to it, this idea that we can't get at any truth that's that has any claim on us. We just have a variety of particular interpretations, and that's very important for Nietzsche. He was very much a what he called himself a perspectivalist, so that there are only different perspectives on the world. There's not a way to come to any universal position. Or we can make no universal truth claims because all our claims are tied to our own particularity. And this is what Nietzsche means by perspectivalism, that we're stuck in our particular position and any attempt at making a universal truth claim would be bogus because it wouldn't, it would always come from this particular position and other particular positions, it wouldn't apply to them. So there's no way to have any universal claim in Nietzsche's way of thinking. So you could say that reducing all truth claims to the particular position of the one making the claim, that's what Nietzsche wants to do. And that's what the sophist wants to do. That all we have are particular truth. We have, if we have truth, all we have are particular truths, not any kind of overarching truth that applies to us all universally. That's the key idea for sophistry. But I think you can, if you're looking at this carefully, you can see the contradiction that arises, right? So the, con the sophist believes all truth is particular, but that is a universal claim for the sophist to make. So the sophist on the one hand declaims any universals, but then says that there are no universals is a universal claim. So the sophist doesn't think you can have an exception to this idea that there are no universals. It's a universal claim. So this to me is the fundamental contradiction of sophistry. So the great contemporary philosopher Alain Badiou understands the relationship between theory or philosophy and sophistry as one of mutual implication and mutual struggle. So his idea is that philosophy is constantly and eternally struggling against sophistry. This is its necessary opponent, he thinks. This is how he puts it in his Manifesto for Philosophy. Philosophy must forever endure the sophist's company and sarcasm. So in other words, for Badu, sophistry is a, a way of keeping philosophy's arrogance in check. That, that sophistry is constantly undermining philosophy, but philosophy has to pay attention to it. It can't go over to the side of sophistry, but it must nonetheless argue with it and struggle with it. And this struggle really defines what philosophy does, according to Badu. And Badu contends that the sophist really brings Platonism alive by killing off the parent figure Parmenides. So Plato has another dialogue entitled Parmenides, where Parmenides, this earlier philosopher, plays a real parent role to Socrates. And it's interesting that the sophist, the visitor from Alea, he really emphasizes that we have to kill off, the, the, he even calls it a parasite, we have to kill off the father figure, Parmenides, in order to constitute a philosophy that is able to attack sophistry. Here's a picture, not a picture, a sculpture of Parmenides, who, as you can see, predated Plato, even though we're not sure about his dates that he lived. We just know that he did live prior to Plato. And he's an Eleatic philosopher who believes that all is one. So Parmenides is among a group of thinkers who thinks that any division, any cut, any rupture within the world is illusory because all all is one. And this is why he thinks that, so the famous Zeno's paradoxes come out of this Eleatic school of philosophy. And the point of them, like, does an arrow ever get to its follow its arc, right? Like it can't, if you keep dividing in half the distance it has to go, it never really arrives where it needs to get to. So Zeno's point is, all must be, we can't understand the world is divided into these this movement of the arrow. Instead, we have to see it all as one. And so motion is just an illusion within the oneness of everything. The problem is, if all is one, 
then nothing cannot be or there is no negation or nothing. So Parmenides rules out any talking about what isn't because if we talk about what isn't, that's it's just nonsensical for Parmenides because everything is. So every, what isn't, isn't. So we, there's nothing you can say about it. So it's an, I think it's a pretty compelling way of thinking but it's a way of thinking that eliminates all negation and all nothingness. Problem is, and Parmenides wasn't concerned with this, without negation, there's no possibility for freedom. So neither Parmenides nor Plato is explicitly concerned with freedom, even Plato, who's introducing negation. But for modern thinkers, this idea of having no space for negation is an elimination of the possibility for any assertion of freedom. Because if we can't say in some way no to what is imposed on us, then how could you conceive freedom? Baruch Spinoza, the modern philosopher, 17th century philosopher, tries to do it, but it's, it really doesn't work because if you don't have some space for negation, you can never have this ability to break from what's given to you, what's imposed on you, and assert something to the contrary, which is what, how we think of freedom. Let's look now at a brief clip from the film Michael Clayton, where Michael Clayton negates himself in order to free himself from the world that's imposed upon him and that he's accepted, but which is a total burden for him. So by destroying these things about himself, he sets himself free. He negates himself in order to be free. He negates the aspects of his identity that then allows him to be free through this negation. I think the claim of Michael Clayton, at least in this scene, is that freedom depends on the ability to negate oneself. So he negates all these aspects of his identity, he throws all his wallet, his identification, his watch, all this, his money, everything into the car so that it'll seem like he's been killed. And thus, he becomes free to act in a way that he wasn't free to act prior to this. So this, to me, is a nice articulation in this scene of the way in which negation is part of and integral to the project of freedom. The problem with the Parmenidean understanding of the world is that if you think of the world all as one, any idea of the world as a whole or as one, you can't think of freedom because there's no room for one to assert something else, something other. And I think that's the, I, that's the problem with Parmenides that Plato, even again, though he's not concerned with freedom, that's what he's getting at here. You might say that freedom depends on a gap or a blank space within the whole, and that's what's articulated through negation or through saying, here's a nothing. This is nothing. That, that opening up of the space of nothing is opening up the space of freedom where I can make an interpretation and understand things and articulate something different and move otherwise from what's been determined. This is how Plato puts it. In order to defend ourselves, we're going to have to subject Father Parmenides' saying to further examination and insist by brute force both that that which is not somehow is and then again that that which is somehow is not. So he's really emphasizing here this undermining of the Parmenidean thesis that all is one and he's doing it through claiming that that which is not is and that that which is also has negation within it. So nothing just, this is what Plato's going to come to, that you can never say not, something just is, that there's always what is not is impacting it and is part of it. Plato introduces this negation into the world in, in order fundamentally to, to 
undermine Parmenides, but ultimately the point is he has to do this in order to refute sophistry. So in order to undermine, so that is to undermine Parmenides is necessary in order to articulate a convincing critique of the sophists. So that's the movement of this, di- the fundamental movement of this dialogue is undermine the Parmenidean idea in order then to articulate an argument against sophistry. That if you don't undermine Parmenides, you can never refute sophistry. That's what Plato's coming to here. Because one has to be able to say about the sophists that they don't know what they're talking about or that they're talking about what is not. So when they make a claim, they're making a claim about something that isn't if it's just a sophistic claim. Here's how Plato puts it. The sophist runs off into the darkness of that which is not. So sophistry holds fast to what isn't, to nothing. And in order to articulate this critique, you have to believe that we can actually talk about that which is not or about nothing. So that's the, that's the move that Plato is making here. Or you could say it this way. In order to critique someone for being wrong, one claims that they are talking about what isn't. And I think that's true any time we critique someone for being wrong, we're saying you're to actually talking about something that isn't. So unless you can make this move, you can never have any critical argument with someone else. You can never critique another truth position unless you believe that we can talk about what isn't and that what isn't actually has some weight and, and can be talked about. If all is one, then actually we can never really have an argument. So if Parmenides was right, there could never be any refutation of him. There can be no conflicting interpretation of things because the conflicting interpretations suggest that all is not one. And they arise out of the not one, out of the fact that there's a divide in the world or a cut or a break or a gap within the whole. The introduction of negation in the sophist, the fundamental claim is that what is not actually is. So if you want to just, in a nutshell, get what the sophist is about and what the main importance of it is, it's that what is not actually is. And Plato gets to this, he gets this, tries to prove this case through a discussion of change. So for Parmenides, if you believe that all is one and that the whole is uninterrupted, you would have to interpret change as illusion. And that's what Parmenides does, that there's no actual change in the world. Change is just our illusory way of perceiving things. Plato, of course, doesn't find this line of thought convincing at all and embarks on a refutation of it. He doesn't say this, but I think one thing at the basis of the way he's arguing is, if change is really illusory, we could ask, what allows this illusion to emerge at all if everything is one? So it's not enough, he thinks, from the perspective of Parmenides to say, illusion, change is just illusion, because the Platonist or the believer in that that which is not has, is, can say back, wait a minute, How can the illusion ever even come about? There must be some gap, some problem, some distortion within the one, within the whole. Otherwise, there would never be an illusion. And I think this is one of the main arguments, not just against Parmenides, but also against Spinoza, who's in some way the modern version, as I suggested earlier, of Parmenides and this philosophy of the whole or the one. And this leads finally, to Plato's refutation of Parmenides. It's through a discussion of change that this refutation occurs. Here's what he says. So it's clear that change really is both something that is not, but also a thing that is, since it partakes in that which is. So Plato's point here is that change actually brings together what is not and what is, and that at some point, in order for change to occur, 
what is not has to become what is. And so they have to be in relationship to each other. Otherwise, you can't understand how change occurs. That change involves both what is and what is not. As he puts it, so it has to be possible for that which is not to be, as in the case of change, and also as applied to all the kinds. So for different kinds to be, for there to be distinction at all, that which is not has to be. And we see this most clearly, as I've suggested before, up till now in change. Dialectics, which is the heart of Plato's philosophy, he's the early, the originator of what we might call ancient dialectics, which is, I think, distinct from Hegelian modern dialectics. But Plato's dialectics focuses on change as the moment when something both is and is not at the same time. That in order to change, it has to have go through this point at which it both is and is not. And Plato's importance on what isn't is what allows us to see how absence constitutes what is present. I think of this, and, and I think this is true, this is important, sorry, for any understanding of jokes, right? And so my one of my favorite jokes to illustrate this is a couple, a man and wife, love to play golf. And the man is a little bit unsure about how well his, how much his wife loves him. And so he says to her, well, uh, if I died and you remarried, would you give the new husband all my clothes? And the spouse says, of, of course not. I would, I would never give away your clothes. And then he goes, well, if, if I died and you remarried, would you give away my car? And she says, no, of course not. I wouldn't let the new husband drive your car. And then he says, well, and this is the big thing. He says, if I died, you remarried, would you give the new husband my golf clubs? And she says, no, he's left-handed. So what's great about that joke, I think, is that it's never articulated that she has a lover who she also plays golf with, right? So it never gets articulated, except if you didn't understand that which is absent, you couldn't, maybe you didn't think the joke was funny, but you wouldn't think that joke is funny when the punchline comes, right? The punchline relies on the role that absence plays in order to constitute everything else that's present in the joke and to constitute the humor of the joke. So to me, this is the great, great discovery of Plato's sophist and this ability. He's, uh, Plato is so often thought of as a philosopher who imposes certain ideal forms on us and that we have to, that, that he doesn't give any space for, what, for alternatives, for what isn't. But I think his whole philosophy at least as it's articulated in the sophist, is about what isn't and about negation and about the space or opening for what's alternative or different. And I think what he understands, maybe as well as any thinker up through Hegel, is that we understand the present through the absent. We understand what is here in front of us through what's not here. And this is an an idea that becomes also relevant in modern linguistics, that it's through differences that we understand what is. This is an idea of Ferdinand de Saussure. But it's also, I think, the essence of Hegel's dialectics. But what's interesting is it's Plato who first comes up with this, and I think it's so vitally important to understand. There's a great example of it in the early scene from the movie The Hangover, which is a film all about absence. All of, it's funny because so much of the things we don't see and if we saw them, they wouldn't be quite so funny. What the fuck happened last night? <sighs> hey, Phil, am I missing a tooth? I can't. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. My lateral incisor, it's gone. Mm. It's okay, okay, okay. We just need to just calm mm. down. We're fine. Everything's mm. fine. Alan, go wake up Doug. Let's just get some coffee in us and get the fuck out of Nevada before housekeeping shows. Everything that's funny that occurs in The Hangover occurs when we don't see it. And what makes it funny is that we don't see it. If we saw them, all the debauchery that produced this mess in their hotel room, we'd be like, ah, okay, it's not that funny. But when we just imagine it, when it's absent, it becomes funny. Now, for Plato, deception arises 
because imitation produces something that is not. So in addition to thinking about the role that absence plays in understanding what's present, Plato understands deception as a way of producing something that isn't through imitation. And much of his philosophy is a critique of imitation. And this is this is a way in which he is on the side of that which is against that which is not. But in order to make this critique, he has to have recourse to that which is not. So it's an interesting point at which Plato is in some way at odds with himself because his critique of imitation is a critique of what isn't, but it has to invoke what isn't in order to make the critique. And for Plato, the imitation pretends to be something that it isn't. So this is a way in which negation is at work or nothing is at work in imitation, that it's an imitation attempts to be something, but it isn't what it attempts to be or pretends to be. And that's the way in which this is not the not, the negation is present Mm -hmm. in every imitation. This is what he says. It's possible for imitations of those that are to be and for expertise and deception to arise from that state of affairs. So he doesn't think that imitations aren't. Instead, he thinks imitations are but they are ways in which what is not is. And that's the crucial thing. And that's how deception works. That deception promulgates the idea that what isn't actually is. And for that to be possible, what isn't has to actually be something. If what was not, if what is not was not, we wouldn't be able to criticize the imitation at all. And this is Plato's point, that even in, even though he's very critical of imitation, we could never articulate this critique unless what is not in some way wasn't. That is, what is not has to be, or else we couldn't articulate this critique of imitation. Probably the greatest film about imitation and the critique of it, although it's also a celebration of imitation, is Ernst Lubitsch's To Be or Not To Be, which chronicles the travails of a acting troupe who's performing Hamlet and also performing a critique of Nazism in Poland. And they join the Polish resistance and it's this depiction of them struggling against the Nazis, but also imitating Nazism. And that's one thing that constitutes the humor in the film, especially in this scene that I'm going to show you next. Uh, Who made you up? I did, Mr. Delbosch. What's wrong with it? I don't know. It's not convincing. To me, he's just a man with a little mustache. But so is Hitler. (laughs) It's not just a mustache. It's something... I don't know. Well, I just can't smell Hitler in him. I can. I know, I know. That picture. That's what he should look like. But that picture was taken of me. And the picture's wrong, too. Okay, this great scene from this great movie shows how imitation negates something. Imitation doesn't work. Like imitation, there's always a gap between what something is and what imitates it. And it's in that gap that we see the role of negation, articulated perfectly by Mr. Dobosh here, the, the, the troop director, who sees that there's some not perfect correspondence between the actor playing Hitler and Hitler himself. And he can't say what it is but there's just a moment, a a gap, a moment of negation between the two. Plato does an interesting thing in the sophist. He deduces negation from difference, and he wouldn't have to do that. So many contemporary thinkers, Gilles Deleuze most significantly, think that difference actually is utterly distinct from negation. So Deleuze believes in a proliferation of differences in the world, but he doesn't actually believe in negation. But Plato thinks once you have difference, you have to have negation. This is his idea as it's articulated in the sophist. And I think this is such a crucial idea and and an interesting and significant move that he makes. And he encourages us in this way to think about how absence 
always plays a constitutive role. So if we think that difference implies negation, that also means that absence constitutes what we are or presence. And those two things are utterly linked for Plato. And even the ideal forms that Plato makes so much of, that Plato makes central to his philosophy, I think can be understood in a way through the sophist because his point about the ideal forms is that they are never actually present in our experience. That is that we never encounter ideal forms in the world, but we know them only through their absence. So we see, like if we take the ideal form of justice, we see all the different real world failures of justice and we constitute the ideal of justice out of those inadequacies of the real world. So the ideal is never present. There's no ever articulation of perfect justice in the world, but we know the ideal form through its absence. I think this is the great move that Plato's making, and it's a way to connect what he's doing in the sophist with his more famous philosophical articulations in the Republic. You might say this, that the ideal forms are, but we know them only through that which is not. The great achievement of the sophist is to help us to understand the vital role of what isn't in understanding what is, and that what isn't has a worth of its own. Even if Plato doesn't go so far as to articulate that himself, at least he points us in that direction, and that's a direction that's going to be vital for all of modern thought.